Well, Keith, um, you've made it. It's yeah. your apex now. You've made, you know, you, you played in the league. You were you won 11 straight gold gloves, a couple World Series, fantastic broadcaster, but now you're on Rain Delay Theater. It's all been worth it. Is this what it's called, Rain? I thought I was... <laughs> 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 Drain Delay Theater? Okay, this wonderful. This is the season finale, too. It's, yeah, this, this is, is a big deal. My, this my big chance for an Emmy? Uh, <laughs> you've got a chance for a lot of big. <laughs> yeah, it really could be. Uh, you know, we had Ron on last year, and I asked him the same question. I, I'm curious what you have to say. You were such a good, popular Major League Baseball player. At any point in your career, did you ever think that you would have this new level of popularity, this new career as a broadcaster where people that never saw you play would think of you in this way. This is why you're famous. This is why they love you. Did that ever cross your mind that it would be anything beyond baseball? No, I did not have any desire to go forward in, in any capacity uh, after I retired from baseball, whether it a coach in the minor leagues or on the big league level. I was just going to, you know, ride off into the into the West and disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's a long story how it happened. I was my first agent and he was just young and aggressive and starting. He saw me in a lanes, said, you should be announcing for the Mets. We exchanged numbers. I said, I don't want to do that. He would call me once every three, four months. And then finally, after a couple of years, I said, okay, go ahead and pitch it if you want. And uh, sure enough, that's how it started. You surprised that what it's become? Like, were you surprised that you liked it as much as you did? Uh, I'm surprised that it's that I got the full-time job. I mean, if you think about it, we've been with 14 seasons yeah. now. Yeah, 14. There's a lot of people that, you know, if you really think about it, a lot of people grew up in, when it was Lindsey, Ralph, and Bob Murphy, and it's what Gary and Ron and I have become basically for that this new generation that we are the voice of the Mets, which I could never understand when I first started in the late 90s, very late 90s, when it was MSG, and they had the revolving doors of announcers, because I grew up with Russ Hodges and Lon Simmons in San Francisco, and you couldn't wait. They, they, they were identified with the Giants in San Francisco. I never understood why the Mets did that, and uh, so when, uh, that's what Fred wanted to do when he formed the network, SNY, and uh, I think it was a smart move, uh, and uh, people kind of, you know, we are part of the organization. We're like the face of the organization. You are too. You're, a, well, you know, you're on the sidelines, but <laughs> you're no, but there. I will, but I will say this. Uh, you know, I want to let Wayne get a word in here. It's you're, in the taxi, you're in the but, taxi yeah, squad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will say, when I got the job, you know, I mean, I, listen, I'm still, I was only 26, I think, when I, I got the job. And there was a level of intimidation. And, uh, yes. a, a, oh, my God, like, this is Gary, Keith, and Ron. You talk about what what you, you know, how you didn't realize what you had become. But, I mean, it is a, it's a major thing to have been chosen to be a part of that. And it took years, really, for me to feel comfortable that I was. I tried to make you feel at home. You did. Because we're a team. I'm a Team, you know, it's interesting. We, I played team sport, yeah. and uh, I knew that you coming in, you were replacing Kevin, that this was a tough spot. A couple and, people liked him. And uh, I just was going to make try to make it as easy, as comfortable, and nice to you, and welcoming, because you I know you're under pressure. Do you remember what you did for me in Tampa Bay? Do you I remember this? I forget. Because I'll never forget this. What and this I, is, I remember I talking to people and saying, this is why he's the captain. This is why what he's did I the do? leader. You, we, we were talking in Tampa Bay my first year, and you were saying how, you know, you, you talked to me a little bit about it, how you understand how much pressure I'm under. And you said, I want you to go research the, uh, the dome in Houston when I played. Do, do some research for me and, and uh, find out some nuggets about, I don't remember exactly what it was, but just find out some nuggets. And I thought I was just going to do some research to help you out. And so I come to the park the next day, and I said, hey, Keith, I, I got a bunch of stuff. He said, great, great, we'll talk a little later. And then on the air that day, Randomly, at one point, you just so hey, you know, Steve, I remember was talking about the uh, the Astrodome or something like this, and you just threw it down to me without any sort. I didn't even know what you were doing, and you had a full conversation with me on the air about it. I did that. Yeah, you don't remember <laughs> it. <at all>? I <laughs> do. <laughs> what a nice guy. <laughs> <What a nice, laughs> <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was amazing. Good. It was good. Amazing. Yeah. All right. uh, Wayne, do you want to introduce yourself? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, thank you for letting me have some time, Steve. <laughs> Uh, you and Ron were teammates on the Mets. You won a World Series together. How has your relationship kind of evolved being in the booth together? 
It has, Ronnie was always a bit of a loner. Ron, when we all, it was a group of us, a uh, small group, it was uh, Rusty, Ed Lynch, uh, Ronnie, myself, Danny Heap, uh, who stayed in the city. So it was like five of us. We were all uptown, Ronnie was downtown. He was just kind of a downtown kind of a guy. And, um, you know, Ronnie of all the pitchers, I was very, uh, I interacted with the pitchers probably too much in the end game. But Ronnie, I knew from the get go after a couple starts that he was someone that I had to leave alone. I couldn't go to the mound and disrupt. And he was his own guy out there. So I left him alone. That's pretty much how he was off the field. What I think has happened is, you know, we all have the pressures of playing. I hate the word pressures, but we have to perform. So uh, life is much more intense when you're a player. I mean, I'm up in the booth. I'm just sitting on my butt and I'm talking. <laughs> and, and I don't have to get a base hit in the ninth inning. Ronnie doesn't have to go out and pitch a big game in September. Uh, so I think we've become more relaxed and our relationship has gone to a different level in the booth and it was a gradual thing uh it it, it it took we've been what 14 years now but i think ronnie and i are are closer than we've ever been and i'd really feel that um i think when when ron's dad got uh ill uh and his dad's doing great now i think that you know you realize your immortality i lost my parents you know you can never get them back and and i i think that that kind of I think change things a little bit you kind of so Ronnie and I have become uh, much more more friendly we didn't hang out when we played we would we bump into each other maybe be at the hotel bar but uh, Ronnie was kind of off to his own and now uh, it's just a really really good friendship it's, it's wonderful let's go all the way back I mean you talk about your your father all the time and and the influence he had on your baseball career you and and your brother I know you could tell 8,000 stories, but when you look back at your childhood, what, what did he do that was so unique with you guys that put you in the position that you were in, that, that ultimately got you to where you could become this type of a player? Well, I think uh, obviously he taught us the game and he was a fireman, so he had worked 24 off 48 hours, so he, had the, he could put the time into summer with the kids in the little leagues teach, t teach the game. But I think more importantly, he was tough and depression era guy that grew up in San Francisco in the, in the inner city and uh, no money. Uh, father had a steady job, my grandfather, at a mattress company, but they lived uh, you know, day to day and uh, he was lucky to have a nickel or a dime in his pocket. He was tough, he served in World War II and he instilled uh, a toughness in my brother and I. I think that's probably the greatest thing that he ever did all of his anecdotes you know what, what's worth whatever's worthwhile does never comes easy uh, you know strive to be the best that was all instilled in me as a young kid um, and that's what drove me in my career to be the best that I can be I didn't want to be just a major league player my goal was to be a major leaguer but it wasn't just to be a 260 hitter 270 280 hitter uh, it was to be a star that was my goal and that was what I was always reaching for and I finally I hope I attained and I think I had a pretty good career I think it was decent yeah <laughs> when did you know that you had become that uh, well it's in my my book uh, it really I'm so uh, it wasn't until that second year after the MVP year in uh, 1980 in April because I had had uh, I got called up in, in 74 in August. Joe Torre got hurt, okay? I did limited playing time. I did real well, around 40 at-bats in a stretch run. We lost the, to the Pirates the last day of the season. Uh, 75, I get sent down. I come back in September, and I kill it in September because the Cardinals are out of it. Uh, 76, I get off to a terrible start. I get benched. They don't send me down. I had a terrible, I was like on the interstate. Awful, and then we fall out of it because the f and uh, I played the whole second half from the All Star break on. I had 3:33. I'm on my way, and then here comes 77, and Vern Rapp takes over, and he brings his Bobo first baseman Roger Freed, and he's touting him. So I was kind of felt my back was against the wall. I'd never had a good April. I knew I had to have one, and I did at my first good April, and that's when I had I thought my breakout year. I hit 15 home runs. I drove in 91 runs. I hit 291. 
And the next year in 78, I have, I hit 250. I have a terrible second half. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't explain it to this. I drove in 24 runs the second, second half of the season. It was awful. And then 79 comes, and I have the MVP year. Okay, so I'm good, bad. Look, I got to, to me, greatness is putting it back to back to back to back. I mentioned it last night in the broadcast. And so I go into 80. I'm confident, but I still feel the pressure of an April. That April was like uh, clouds over my head. And opening day, I hit, I had a big day, and I felt great. I knew I was on my way, and I knew I belonged. What did you unlock to get that consistency? What did I unlock? Yeah, what did you unlock? Like what, you said even to this mm. day you can't really figure out why you would have that inconsistent start or bad second half. What happened in 79 where all of a sudden it locked into place and you became start to finish that consistent player? Well, I had the bad year. April in, uh, in, in 79. I hit 232 in April, so I wound up hitting 344. If I had just had a... Every other year, I had I had two 380 months, and uh, I, I, the lowest month I hit was 333, and I just killed it for five months. But I had Ken Boyer as my manager, who saw me and, and managed me in Tulsa, where I led the league in hitting. He saw me play two years, and he came back and he said, "You're my first baseman." It took a big load off my mind. I remember that was a it was my uh, watershed moment right there. If it wasn't Kenny wasn't there, I don't know what would have happened much like what Davey was when he got called to manage the Mets and he managed all those kids that were young and that young team in 84 he managed them in Tidewater he knew what they could do it just it takes that he gets someone from the outside he doesn't know about the personnel you can get you can get lost in the shuffle you get off to a bad start um, how it all fell in and then I, after that it was all downhill it wasn't never downhill it was just I just I just drove myself and I always pushed myself. And I was always one that worried when I went in a slump, I would always worry what I'm doing wrong. And, and, uh, and I think it was just part of my drive. I was always a fear of failure with me. And Ronnie said the same thing, where you know, Lou Brock always embraced the game. I, I wish I could have played that way, but it just wasn't me. My brother has the Irish side of, of him. He's, he's, he's in sales, he's a State Farm guy, and i am kind of got the Spanish side. I'm a brooder, and uh, that's, I'm my father, Gary is my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it would have been in reverse, but no, nope, maybe, maybe that's what that, maybe right. that's what it took for me to have that kind of personality, that kind of mentality, that uh, drove me to be the what I became. What was the difference between being a, a superstar for the Cardinals and being one for the Mets in your in your life, and and how you were treated in St. Louis, and and how you were treated in New York? Well, gosh, it's. Totally. St. Louis, it took me a while. They knew what they had, and I had a lot of years. I would never want to be go through that early part of my career ever again. I was, 20, I was up when I was 20, and I would never want to go from 20 to 23 again. Those, those four years, it was just uh, a lot of anxiety, not knowing if I was going to make it. I got that deal getting sent down. Got to, had the deal of getting benched. Um, but once I became a star there, it's a big baseball town, and um, it was wonderful. When I came here, this was a team that had trades, traded Seaver. They weren't drawing anybody. They were a last place team. And I was just very fortunate that all the, they didn't squander their, uh, their draft picks. I mean, all of a sudden, I come to spring training in, in 84, and I see all these young guys that have all this talent. So I was lucky. I mean, Whitey really thought he was sending me to Siberia and trading me to, to the Mets. And uh, a form of punishment, I know it, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened. And then to be a, to be a popular player here and a, a performing player, um, you know, New York, and particularly with the Mets being down, always only had one world championship and one National League flag. Uh, back in the last one in 73, uh, Met fans were just ready to embrace this team. Uh, just any team that came up and had a winner. But our, uh, so that was just extraordinarily fun because I had attained everything in my career. I had attained all the personal things. I got a gold glove, an MVP, a batting title. I was an all-star. The only thing left was a World Series and I got it in St. Louis. I come over to the Mets, it gave me a new goals, a new team. It kind of it was like a shot in the arm for me. And then when I saw the kids and the young guys in spring training, it was just oh, so much fun. 84 was such a fun year. So 
We've talked to a bunch of guys from that 86 team, and unprompted, every one of them says, when you came over, it changed everything. The leadership that you have, obviously part of that is, is natural. You can't just fake something like that. But when you talk about the new challenge, when you came over, when you saw the young talent, how much did you say, okay, this is now my responsibility as a guy who knows how to win, who just won in St. Louis, to bring that here and to elevate? Because it's one thing to be talented, but it's another thing to be championship caliber. So how much of that did you feel was a personal responsibility? Well, I went into spring training in 84. There was basically it was George Foster, Mike Torres, and Ron Hodges and myself were the only the veterans on that team. Uh, older veterans mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't go in there with any plan I was in great shape I ran all winter uh, it was the first year I started running and uh, I came in shape and I was just ready to go and so I could Daryl was a little wasn't in the no one was in great shape as good a shape as I was Mookie probably was but <laughs> I could have fun with Daryl and, and uh, make make fun when we're doing sprints because I was I was ready to rock. And um, Frank Cashin came to me in spring and asked me if I would um, uh, accept the, would I be the guy that would talk to the press? And I said, sure. Um, so that was the first inkling that Frank wanted me to be something more, but I didn't, it didn't really click. Mm -hmm. Then it wasn't like, okay, this is what Frank wants me to do. I gotta, you know, it, it just, I think you have to, I played a lot of players that are great players, and what you get out of them is just what they they give you on the field. And uh, then I played with players that uh, just give so much the intangible. I learned my lessons from Lou Brock, and I know we always make fun of Lou. <laughs> I feel like we need that Lou Brock graphic that we use on the broadcast. Right. <laughs> so, uh, what Lou did for me in my struggles, I don't know if I would have survived without Lou. And I swore when I. I said, if it ever comes to a point where I'm Lou and I'm going to do the same thing. So I know everybody, everybody looks at the players on TV and, and they look like grown men and they just like, they don't have any emotion. They don't have any anxieties. They do. They have a lot of self-doubt. I certainly did. And so I was just going to, uh, it was easy for me to, I, I embraced it and I really enjoyed it. I loved, I loved Wally and and uh, Lenny and McDowell. I love hanging, they were all, look, they're all 22 years old and I'm 29, 30 and I've done all I'd, you know, it was, it was role reversal for me. And I just moved right into it easily. I think you have to care about people. You have to care about the team, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now when you left, David Cohn started wearing number 17. Uh, growing up in Chicago, I know that Mark Grace tried to imitate everything you did including wearing 17 and how he tried to play first base. What did it mean to you to have guys, you know, wear that number or try to emulate the way that you played? Well, for David, no one's ever asked me that question. <laughs> You're the first one. I was so flattered that David wore that. And he came out publicly and said he was wearing it in my, in, you know, as a tribute to me. And I was in Cleveland, I guess, I, or I don't know what year he did it, whether it was the first year I was gone or whatever, but I was so flattered. Uh, it, it meant a lot to me. Um, and David was another guy that I took under my wing a little bit when he got traded over. And I remember we're over at Al Lang Field in St. Pete and we got him from, we heard all about him. And uh, I went out and there was batting practice. He's out by himself in center field and I had already taken my ground balls and fielded my throws from my infielders. So I walked like John Wayne real slow out <laughs> towards him. And, it, and I knew that he was seeing me coming and I would just took my time. <laughs> and then I wound up talking to him, the rest of the BP for around, you know, just to welcome him. And he remembers that. And, um, you know, we're great friends to this day. Um, what was the other part of your question? Well, Mark Grace. Oh, Mark Grace, play. yes. Uh, and he's also a pretty doggone good fielder too. So that's all very flattering. It's always nice when you get first basemen that come up to you and say present day, and that saw me, and not the new generation, they never saw me play. Yeah. So, but in the 90s, uh, the guys coming up, it, it, it's, uh, it's always very, very, very flattering. And it's something that I worked very hard at. Uh, defense was very important for me. Well, I read there was a rule change because of you. Yes. Because you said- It wasn't a rule change. It was just, in, in, it was just 
um, what would be the word? It's a rule that was enforced. enforced. Yeah. Because you would set up in foul territory to take pickoff throws. Right. So you right. Could just drop your glove down. Right. Uh, why did they start to enforce that rule because of you? Because uh, it was Whitey Herzog, and we were in Mon we were in Shea Stadium. It might have been 85, and but they had Coleman at top of the order, uh, Ozzie Smith, Willie McGee, they had all those guys that stole bases. I mean, anyway, I always stood. Here's the line right here. Can you get this? Can you see that? Rob, our okay. camera guy. This is the, the first base line right here, and that's home yeah. plate. And here's 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 the the base here. We'll go this way. So here's, so if I put my f my right foot here and my left foot here, my tag comes right here. Now Whitey, the rule book says only one person can be in foul territory. It's the catcher. So a technicality, I had he moved me in. So I'm and now I'm here, and the base is back here. I have to come back here to tag. Right. So it was Whitey was very very wise to do that. <laughs> He didn't do it to, um, you know, get me upset. He, he, it was something to help win a ball game. That's how smart Whitey was. Uh, the defense, you said it, it was something you worked really hard at, and, and there was nobody better, really nobody better. So was it something that you just innately understood? I mean, so many people just, especially <coughs> players now, teams now put less of an emphasis on defense. Was it something you understood that, it was an equal part of the game, or was it something that you just loved? Well, number one, my dad said when we were kids, my brother and I growing up, because if you are a good defender, and that wasn't the term he used, he goes, the manager, well, when you go in a slump and you're going to go in slumps, he'll be less inclined to take you out of the lineup. Because if you're just a hitter and you go into a prolonged slump and you're, not, you're, not, and you're hurting your team in the field, so I always remembered that. He was a first baseman, a very good fielder. He taught us how to, my brother and I had a field. My brother was a good fielder too. Uh, so the fielding part was uh, easy for me. The hitting is the hard part. And I evolved as I got more experience. They always say when young players, the game speeds up and you learn to slow the game down. And that comes with confidence and experience and you know the situations. I mean, I always told myself, okay, whatever. Batter comes up, okay, runners on first and second, one out, seventh inning, three to two ball game. Balls hit to me, what am I gonna do? That was all, every, every bat, okay? If, if the situation changed, it was just, that was top of my father to do that. So you know what to do, the ball's hit, if it's a bullet, and it's on you real quick, and like, a, like that, if you're holding a runner on, it's instinctual, you know where to go. So, and then I just kind of perfected um, as I went along. You know, I, they used to do the first and third steals where you get a guy getting a rundown, and that used to petrify me because the runner's there. Uh, I learned as I got older how easy it was to break that, and it was all in slow motion, and that comes with experience. Um, and really was the fun part of the game. I mean, I, I did some things at first base that I don't think my father ever taught me. I, I just kind of learned on my own. And I mean, I threw runners out at third. I had a good arm. So I could, um, if hitting was as easy as fielding, I would be uh, in the Hall of Fame, trust me. Well, well, you know, I think there are a lot of people who think you should be. I'm one of them. Uh, I'm the uh, second one of them. You know, where your career, I think, now can be looked at in a different way than it was after you retired, where people can appreciate what you did defensively, not to mention the way that you did carry a load offensively and the two World Series championships. Uh, you know, we've seen guys get kind of rediscovered toward their Hall of Fame candidacy. Uh, do you think that will happen to you, and, and do you believe in yourself that you're a Hall of Famer? I think I'm... Uh I think I'm, from an offensive point of view, I mean, I'm in a position that's a power position, corner infield position. If I'd have been a shortstop, I'd be in the Hall of Fame right now. If I was a second baseman, I'd be in the Hall of Fame. Um, so I've always felt that maybe I'm borderline, and uh, the fact that I didn't hit 300 the last two years with the injuries, I was hitting 303 lifetime, and that that kills me that I'm a 296 lifetime hitter when the last two years with an injury killed me. It would have been nice to hit 300, but that's the breaks. Um, I think that there's not enough, uh, there's 
uh, it's always been home runs have been very important in the Hall of Fame. Uh, defense hasn't been that uh, much of, uh, hasn't been in the spotlight. You know, we're talking about uh, analytics here and all the new stuff that they love me. You know, yeah. I, um, I always had, I have very high on base percentage. You know, I always, my dad always said, the third hitter is the most, third and fourth hitter are the prestigious spots in, the line, in my day. Uh, third hitter is your best hitter. I think of Tony Oliva, Tommy Davis. You're an RBI guy, you're a clutch hitter, you're the best hitter on the team, and you get on base. Why? Because you got the four, five, and six hitters coming behind you. And with the Mets, the four, five, and six was Carter, Strawberry, McReynolds, all guys that hit a lot of home runs. So I had a dual purpose. And the three hole was to be a setup guy as well as an RBI guy because I had speed in front of me. So it was always important for me to have a high on base percentage. But um, I didn't look for walks. Uh, but there's certain situations in the game that your at bat changes. I say it on the air is, and uh, Nimmo has gotten better at it, is that there's certain times that Nimmo looks for a walk when there's a man on base. He's gotten much better with it. And okay, if it's the seventh inning and you're losing by a run and I lead off, I am not the third hitter that at bat. I'm the leadoff hitter. I got to get on base. So I might be more patient in that bat at bat, but I'm ready to hit. So as opposed to if I come up in the seventh inning and a men are on base, I'm not looking for a walk. I'm looking to tie the ball game or put us ahead. With the changing voter base, like you talked about, the analytics, they love you. And, and like I said, and Wayne said, we think you're a Hall of Famer. Um, as the voting has started to change, have you started to think about it again more? Is it something that's top of mind, or have you been able to I, put it? I think aside? about it. I do. Uh, I'll say this. Ralph Kiner said it, uh, that I was a Hall of Famer because I transformed the first base. So that coming from Ralph, that meant a lot to me. Gary Carter, when he was dying, said that I was the best player that he'd ever played with. And he played with some good players with Montreal. And that meant a lot to me. Um, I do think that uh, I kind of agree with Ralph that I think I brought back in the spotlight the importance of first base. I mean, who gets more action in the game outside of a catcher and the pitcher than the first baseman? I mean, you can lose a lot of games with a guy that can't do scoops and the ball's down the right field line, the bases are loaded, two outs, and there's three runs that are going to score. So it's an important position and it's overlooked. So we'll see. If I do, I do. I mean, when I'm dead and gone, is it going to matter one way or the other? <laughs> I mean, hopefully, I'm, I'm going to get. Hopefully not. I'm going to get. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I mean, I'm going into the. I'm, I'm getting the, in <laughs> dust. I'm not going to take any space. It's in my will. I'm not taking any space on this earth. My kids are going to get my ashes, and they're going to get rent a boat, and they're going to go out to the Golden Gate Bridge, and go out into the Pacific Ocean. Get. I told them to make sure they go downwind. <laughs> and they're going to dump my ashes into the, <laughs> under the Golden Gate Bridge. I was going to say, when you said the ashes, I was going to say, yeah. you're going to get buried at sea. But the answer is yeah, yes. Absolutely. Um, Jerry Kuzman's number is going to be retired yes. by the team next year. Uh, Jeff Wilpon said the door is more open now to have more numbers retired. I think your name and David Wright's name are probably the two that jumped into people's minds immediately when that was said. Um, is that... Is that in line with the Hall of Fame for you? If, if your number gets retired, is that by, by one of the organizations you played for, is that as close as, as Cooperstown would be to your heart? Uh, it, would, it would be very nice to have my number up there. I think it would be great. Uh, I do think that our 80s team, even though we only won once, we actually won twice, we, we won our division and lost to the Dodgers. As in, we only won one World Series, but we had the really, the, I think, the best uh, nine years in Met history, back to back to back. Um, I do think I was an integral part of that and uh, integral part in turning that culture around. I know what goes on here when I, this, these Met teams currently, because they're like the little kid on the block, like the White Sox to the Cubs, uh, the Oakland A's to the Giants, um, but more so here, the Yankees have had such, you know, such a tradition and uh, such a history that it, it's tough to come here and and change, be positive and turn that around. And that's something that we did. 
um, and, you know, in, in 84 when it was, that was pretty rapid. I never expected us to win 90 games that year. Uh, but the only way to do it is to go out there and perform. So uh, it would be very nice. I mean, who wouldn't want to do it? Shoot, that would be wonderful. Uh, that would be very sweet. We're in. We're in on the Hall of Fame. We're in on the number <laughs> retirement. You want us to start the campaign and, and push it? We'll do we that. We don't need any convincing. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to end the, the interview, the podcast, without talking some specifics about that 86 year. And listen, it's been looked at 8,000 different ways, and everybody knows about game six. And But the thing that I'm, I'm fascinated, I can ask the same question to every person that was on that team because it was such an unbelievable finish to game six. When was the moment that you truly understood what had just happened? Was it something that immediately when, when you guys win that game hits you how unbelievable that was? Or is it a week after, two weeks after, a year after, where it really sinks in that this was a miraculous finish to a game? Well, I think... Uh, my reaction was what everybody else's reaction was when the ball went through Buckner's leg. Before that, the wild, the wild pitch, that set the that tied the game, and advanced the runners into a ray in a scoring position. Um, it is the most amazing comeback I think, and it has to be in World Series history for it's a single game of that importance. I mean, we're two out, one out from uh, elimination. And um, nobody on. And there it was. But that was what our team was. And, uh, you know, we had a tough, we had a, we knew we had our hands full against Houston with their pitching and their team. And we, and we, we, got, we got through that. Uh, and Boston was a good team, man. I mean, Red Shandy's told me, and I'll forget this. He goes, you know, he goes, the teams that get to the World Series, they didn't get there by a lark. They got there because they're good. It's the two best teams. So it's just it's 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 it's, it's about and anybody can win in a seven game series. So I always remembered that. And Boston had a lineup. We were fortunate we had the home field advantage because we played six and seven when Don Baylor couldn't DH. And everybody forgets Don Baylor was the DH. They had a lineup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they also had a lead in game seven. You guys had yes. to come back in that one too. Yes. And, and Daryl had a home run and Ray Knight had a home run. You had a big hit in that game yep. as well. What was the feeling when they went up in game seven like? And it started to get pretty late before you guys came back. The whole playoff was like an uphill slog for us, uh, I felt. We were down in every game in Houston, against Houston, except game two. We knocked Ryan out early. We won five to one in game two. Every other game we fell behind and came back. It was like a death struggle. and. Then Boston, we uh, were pretty much, we got off hot and, uh, well, we fell behind, well, obviously, 0-2. Oh Lenny gets the leadoff home run, ignites us in that game. And then the Carter hits the two home runs, and uh, now we're 2-2, two and two, but, but Hurst, we couldn't, we couldn't solve Hurst. Everybody says, uh, okay, they lost game six, there's no way they're going to win game seven. Now, I didn't feel that way. And when they got out in front, I go, here we go again. I feel like I was like climbing Mount mm -hmm. Everest again. You know, and here I come up in this situation, um, just like in 82, so ironic, late in the game, we're down, and I got to get a base hit. I can't get a sacrifice fly, because that's not going to do any good. It's just going to bring us a run closer. We needed a base hit. So it was two World Series I played in, in two game sevens, and late in the game, I come up in the same situation where it's on me. And I remember uh, I, when Hurst walked Tuffle, and I was surprised. I threw him a 3-2 curveball. And I said, that son of a b He's gonna, He wants to pitch to me? And, uh, but at the same time, I'm going, oh, God, what am I, I, what am I gonna do? Go, go walk in the dugout and go get my car and drive away? <laughs> I, gotta get, I, I gotta get in the box. So I remember my brother was sitting in box seats behind home plate at Shea. And he's always been my talisman, my, my good luck charm. And um, I was on my knee and I went to get up and I looked up at him and he just went. And I got up there, I took a deep breath and uh, got in and he dropped a curveball on me first pitch and I, I buckled and I said, oh shit, I'm on one. So I choked up and all that was needed was a base hit. So I choked up another inch and I just had a hunch he was 
going to, the book on me was in, and he was going to try to throw that hard sinker he had. And he th tried to throw it up and in, and he missed. And I got the base hit. And uh, when I got to first base, I mean, I can't tell you how relieved I was. That's what I was going to what the What's the feeling? The when feeling you come is uh, accomplishment. Um, I win. I got a big clutch hit, I know, but still it was like I had just was a big, it was a relief. Those at bats were, I look back on them, and they weren't like July, I come up against the Reds or the Dodgers and it's the seventh inning and or yeah. two outs in the ninth. This is a World Series. Mm -hmm. And um, they were, I've never had a pressure, more pressure packed two at bats in my career. Do you so, remember the noise? Do you hear it? No, uh, you do, but you don't. It's, it's, um, do you're you so far. You, do you hear it after you come through? Like still, when you're still don't. You do, but you don't because mm -hmm. you're so in the moment. You know, you're just in the moment. Your focus has got to be there. You said that you didn't buy into all the talk about, well, they lost game six, they're going to lose game seven. You know, I think um, Herb Brooks, at the Miracle on Ice mm -hmm. after the USB rush, I think his pregame speech to his team before their, their gold medal game, because that was not the gold medal game, was if you lose tonight, you're going to regret this for the rest of your effing lives. I think that was the whole thing, right? right? Is there an unspoken pressure when you win a game six the way that you do to feel like we have to finish the job? I, I, more pressure than there would be for any game seven of a World Series. Obviously, it's as heightened as it gets, but is there all of a sudden, uh, well, we can't lose this now? Uh, no, it wasn't that. It was just a, now it was more relief that we got out of Dodge there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got, we lived to fight another day. It was a remarkable comeback. I mean, come on. I was in the clubhouse. Kevin Mitchell's in his locker, and you know the urban uh, legend is that he didn't have his uniform on. He did. <laughs> and he was in his he was, he was in his locker. And Buddy Harrelson, I'm by my locker. I made the second out, and Buddy Harrelson comes flying by me and goes, "Kevin, what are you doing? You're hitting." <laughs> and Kevin go grabs his hat, ran out and down the runway, goes in and gets the on deck first pitch, base hit. <laughs> Base. And so, but anyway, the answer to your question is that we lived to fight another day. We got, we got away, and it was a relief. After that game, it was an absolute disbelief and relief mm -hmm. that we had game seven. And then game seven was entirely different. Mm -hmm. It's like playing game six down three to two. The, uh, Steve asked you or said to you earlier when we asked the other 86 Mets, and they said, who was the guy we needed to win that thing? The answer was you. Who's the answer to that question for you? Who's the, guy, who's the other guy on the team that you absolutely needed to have to make that a championship team? Well, I think Carter was the final piece. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Gary only played, what, three years for us or whatever. He had two good years in his, you know, his knees. He, what he had to go through every game, ice and everything, he, the years of catching had worn him down. Um, but I knew when we got him that he would be great for our pitching staff because he called a real aggressive game and he was just intense. When you can't have enough intense players, I'm sorry. You know, you can't have all laid back players. And then again, you, I think you can have all hyper guys that, on one team, but I don't think you can have all laid back guys. And you're going to have your easygoing guys, and you're, we had a overload of guys that were the, the button was pushed. They were Energizer bunnies. Mm -hmm. Ray Knight was one, and Gary was one. And it's so important that position. Gary called such a good game. I never liked Montreal. Had a great pitching staff. They should have won when, at least once, when he was with them. And why they didn't, I have no idea. They were so talented. Their pitching staff was so good. And Gary called a very aggressive game. And I knew that he would take charge of this young staff, and uh, he took it to another level. And I think Ronnie's admitted to that, too. I think he said that, mm -hmm. um, that he meant that much. So in that regard, not so much as bat, which was very important. I mean, he brought us uh, 30 home runs and 100 RBIs. Uh, but I think his greatest contribution was what he brought in the pitching staff. Keith's greatest contribution to this point in his career has to be this show. <laughs> like Season said. finale. Season finale. Uh -oh. Oh, do you remember the name of the show now? Uh, Rain Delay Theater. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. How many Rotten Tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs>
Jeez, you're the best. You got it. Thanks, man. All right, guys. My pleasure. Uh,